Hey guys, welcome back to my channel and welcome to a Devo with me. Today's Devo, we're gonna be talking about the fruit of the spirit piece. And I actually am teaching you pretty much exactly what I taught two weeks ago um, to the girls at my small group. I was invited to teach on this specific subject of the fruit of the spirit piece and I thought that that was an honor and I felt like the teaching was very spirit led and helpful. So I thought I would make that into this video for you guys. I want this to be interactive, even though I cannot see you guys, I can't be doing this with you guys in real time. I hope that you have maybe a pen and a piece of paper, your Bible, and you're able to follow along with me. I'm gonna be asking you guys some questions and it's my hope that you would pause the video after the question, take time to answer the question with a pen and a paper in your Bible, and then continue on in the video and just do that for each question that I ask periodically. So to get started, I just wanna start off by asking what does peace look like to you? You can write that down in your journal um, or think about it, whatever works for you. When I taught this in small group, a lot of the answers were like a person or a place or um, a situation or a memory and all of those things are awesome. You can have such peaceful feelings in, in all of those, but as we go on in this, I want to kind of unravel what the fruit of the spirit peace actually looks like, what that really should look like in our lives and how we can grab a hold of it tangibly. So I like to look up definitions when I'm studying the Bible. I like to know what the Bible's definition is in contrast with what like the dictionary says about that word because a lot of times they're not the same or they're similar in concepts, but the Bible the actual like worldview is different. So the definition of peace in the dictionary is freedom from disturbance, quiet and tranquil. The definition of peace in the Bible is calm and tranquility of soul in the midst of difficult circumstances. So you see how when we look at the worldview of peace in terms of the world, it's just a calmness, a tranquility. It's not attached to any one or any circumstance or any anything. It's just a calmness, a tranquility. And when we look at the Bible's definition of peace, we say that we see that it's a calmness, a tranquility of soul in the midst of a difficult circumstance. So you see that circumstantial piece added on to the end of that definition, which is so important as we uncover and as we unpack what the fruit of the spirit peace actually is. And that really changed my perspective as I started. That was kind of the first thing that I started with when I was studying this was, okay, wow, like there's, there's this added condition on the end of the tranquility, on the end of the calmness is important to my faith, to my relationship with Jesus. So I wanna tell you about this real life story where two men were entering a art contest and they were asked to draw, um, to paint what peace looked like. And one guy, he painted a picture of a beach with a beautiful sunset. It was serene, it was, it was beautiful. It's what in the world we would say is peace to us. It's getting away from the world, it's escaping, it's going to where everything is quiet, where everything is still and serene. That's what his painting was. And then there was another guy and he painted a picture that was treacherous, that was chaotic, that looked like pressure. There was lightning, there was thunder, there was waves, there was wind, there was just pressure, there was chaos everywhere. And you put those two pictures by, side by side and you say, wait, this looks like peace. This does not look like peace. That doesn't look anything look like peace. That looks like what my life looks like currently, or that looks like what my life looks like in just a season ago. But if you zoom in on that picture of the wind and the waves and the storm, you can see a little bird just perched right in the middle of it all. Just a little bird chilling, <laughs> just doing nothing, just being still, just abiding. And he actually won the prize. That is what true peace is. That is what true biblical peace is when you think about it. There's some scripture about peace that I wanna to read to you. John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Colossians 3, 15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts 
since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Number six, 24 through 27 says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace so that they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Psalm 85, eight says, I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. And the last scripture that I wanna read is John 15, five. It doesn't say anything about peace, but it is a key verse in some of the other things that I wanna to continue to share with you guys. So it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So a question to pause and think about is what causes you to not have peace? What are peace blockers in your life? Whether you're currently in a season where you feel like your life is that picture that I showed, or you feel like you're in a pretty calm season or a waiting season or whatever it looks like. What in the past or in the present are peace blockers to you? If we think about the verse John 15, five, we see that Jesus is the vine, we are the branches and God is the vine dresser. If you read more of that, the, the scripture surrounding John 15, five, you see that God is the vine dresser. So in that verse, John 15, five, it says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So in order to bear fruit, in order to bear the fruit of peace, you have to be connected to the vine. You can't be disconnected from, from the vine. Like if you're looking at a, a, a grapevine, grapes apart from the vine cannot grow. They can't produce nutrients, they can't produce fruit. So we have to be connected to the vine. We have to be in relationship with Jesus. We have to be pursuing him in our lives or else the peace that we want, the joy that we want in our lives, the the faithfulness, the goodness, the love, all of those things cannot be produced by ourselves. We cannot, by ourselves, apart from God, create those things in a true, like, life-giving, fulfilling, I'm going to give this to someone else way. We can't do that. And if you look at all of those scriptures that I just talked about, that I just read to you, it doesn't say that we create them ourselves. It doesn't say the peace that you create, the peace that you bring to yourself or give to yourself. It says the peace that Jesus brings, the peace that the, the peace giver brings, the peace that Jesus promises. It doesn't say that you get that when you go on vacation. It doesn't say that you get that when you're in the presence of a person, a worldly person in your life. It says that you get all of that in Jesus Christ. A lot of times we feel like all right, I don't have peace, so I'm gonna create peace. I'm gonna manufacture peace. I'm gonna manufacture faithfulness. I'm gonna manufacture generosity or gentleness. And we just can't do that by ourselves. We might be able to do that for a season, but it's always fleeting. It's always, always fleeting. I know a lie I believe is that if I am lacking of peace, it's that Jesus is not with me, that he doesn't care. Um, that he doesn't want to be a part, that he doesn't want to give me peace. That is a straight lie from the enemy because if we recognize that peace is a gift and a gift that only Jesus can give, we cannot be robbed of our peace. If we are peaceless, it's because we have separated ourselves from Jesus or we have listened to a lie and taken our peace and given it to the enemy. We can't be robbed of it because it's a gift we can only give it away. And so I, when I realized that, I was like, how many times in my life am I giving away my peace to the enemy by listening to the lies that he is saying to me and trying to get me to believe about myself that ultimately is a lie about what I believe about God. Every lie that I believe about, about myself is a lie that I actually believe about God. So the next passage of scripture that I'm gonna read is from Mark 4, 35 through 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, squall is in the storm, came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? 
He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. There's a couple things that I want to point out in this scripture before I read to you what I'm going to read word for word what I wrote down based off of this scripture. But there's a few things that I want to point out. And one of those things is that the scripture, the verse 35, the first verse says, Let us go over to the other side. So that's important because Jesus before they even got in the middle of the storm, made a promise to them and said, we will make it to the other side. Did you like, it's almost like he was saying it subtly, but I wonder if the disciples just like completely missed that. They had to have because they, they got scared and they got worried. If we, if the disciples in the boat would have remembered that Jesus had said that before they even got in the boat, before they even got in the storm, literally Jesus Christ with them in the boat had said that, I don't think that they would have reacted the same way. The other part is verse 38 where they went and they found Jesus and they said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Like how many times in our life when we're in the middle of Again, that scene, that picture of the wind and the waves and the pressure where we look up to God and we say, don't you care that I am suffering right now? Don't you care that I am so peaceless right now or that I'm frustrated that I'm in pain or that I've been waiting for so long? It's a lie that the enemy gets us to believe when we're in the, the midst of that circumstance where you know the definition of peace is tranquility of soul in the midst of a difficult situation and we say well i don't feel that right now i don't feel tranquility of soul in the midst of this situation so jesus must not be in the situation with me but in this passage jesus was in the boat with them and so i'm going to read you now what i wrote when life gets hard we're tempted to run away from it and escape it because our souls are hardwired to long for peace we use social media we use people we use books but all of that is a temporary escape. Until we recognize that our need for peace can only be met with Jesus, we will be manufacturing false peace and then get mad at God that it didn't last long, that he wasn't there or that he didn't do anything. Did you forget all the things that Jesus said and promised before the waves now that you are in the midst of the storm? And that, that is reference to that first passage in verse 35 where Jesus said, we'll make it to the other side. And I think when we're looking at our life circumstances, even if we don't hear specifically Jesus say like, this thing is going to happen. There are things that you can look back on in your life and see Jesus's faithfulness and where he's been faithful and where his hands have been and see that he has brought you through to know that he will do it again. He's not going to leave you in the middle of the storm by yourself to fend for yourself and to create your, your own fruitfulness. He's not going to do that. So we have to be we have to be children who believe that the God who saved us before, the God who got us through that before, the God who fulfilled his promise before will fulfill his promise again. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in the midst of a storm with Jesus in my boat and be the one who was running around on the deck terrified while my savior and rescuer is sleeping in the bunker below. I want to recognize the treacherous situation and allow my spirit to instantly connect with the fact that when I got in the boat, Jesus did too. And if he is sleeping, I should go find him and curl up next to him because peace is where Jesus is. And if he's sleeping on a pillow, my peace is found there. So I can call on Jesus from the deck and say, Jesus, Jesus, come stop the wind. But there will be more peace and a deeper refining of my faith if I trust that going to where he is resting is going to give me the same rest too. When I think about my situation um, with Azariah, when I think about my peace in the middle of the storm, I think about diagnosis day and I think about the fact that when Craig and I were, after we had got the diagnosis and there was a numbness of the soul, um, there was a numbness of feelings where I just, I don't even know how to describe it. You only know what that feels like if you've been through it. And I remember sitting in the driveway with Craig that day and Waymaker was playing in the background. And in that moment, I 
the last thing that I wanted to do was pick up my camera and start filming. In fact, Craig looked at me and he was like, what are you doing? Why are you filming this right now? And right before I picked up my camera, I felt in my soul, it wasn't, there was not an audible voice or anything like that. I've never heard the audible voice of God. It was just a feeling, a knowing in my soul that I am going to want to look back on this and see what God had done. And so I chose in that moment to feel the fear, to feel the numbness, but I let my faith be louder. I allowed it to be louder. I allowed my faith to give me, for Jesus to deposit into me that peace, to sprout that peace out from me in order to be able to pick my camera up and look straight into the lens and say, this is so small for God. And I feel like that for me and for Craig was the defining moment of the rest of the journey for us. Because if I would have let the tranquility and the calmness of soul to turn into the, the rage and the disgust and the anger and all of those emotions, if I let those become what my soul was crying, then my, my mindset, my take on the whole situation would have been differently. But I didn't, I was, what I think is really interesting is that up until that point, up until diagnosis day, I was in the most purposeful, intentional relationship with Jesus that I had ever been in. I was on fire for God. I was pursuing him daily. I was in community. I was in prayer every day. I was just on fire for the Lord. And I was connected to him. I, I view that time in my life as so connected to the vine that my entire life was just producing fruit only because I was connected to the vine and because the Holy Spirit was allowing that to be made possible in my life. But if I was not connected to the vine, if I didn't believe what Jesus said about himself was true. If I didn't believe what the Bible said, if I didn't believe the promises of the gospel, then I wouldn't have reacted that way. And I think I thank God every day that that I was connected to the vine that he had used every single season up until that point to get me to that point to be so rooted in him, so deeply rooted in him that it Yes, I felt every human emotion. I felt every numbness. I felt everything, everything in that moment. But my roots went deeper than my fear did. We have a choice when we're in the middle of a storm and there's wind and there's chaos all around us. We have a choice to run frantically on the top of the deck and say, Jesus, where are you? Jesus, where are you? Jesus, where are you? Or we can get still in the and go find Jesus, get in the presence of Jesus, rest with him, rest in him, because you cannot look in the gospel, you cannot look in the Bible and find anywhere where it says, if you go to Jesus, you won't find rest. There's nothing. Matthew 11, 28 through 30, it says, come to me all who are weak and weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and you will find rest for your souls. My, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That is a promise that if you believe, if you internalize, if you move it from here to here in your storm, it can change you, it can change so much for you because your character is going to be refined. You are going to come out of that storm looking more like Jesus. I'm gonna read you a little bit more and that's gonna be the end of this. But if I think about the story with Jesus on the boat, I can totally imagine the frustration that the disciples would have felt if they forgot that Jesus was in the boat when the wind and the pressure and the waves were strong. And then the confusion and the anger that rose in them after they had started panicking and worrying when they found him in the boat, sleeping, seamlessly doing absolutely nothing. But if they would have remembered that the Jesus who just healed blind eyes and made the lame walk was in the boat with them, their first emotion, their first emotion would have been maybe a little bit of fear and disappointment and anger, but their action wouldn't have been to panic. It would have been to go and to run to him. And I look at, I look again at my circumstance and I felt disappointment and I, I felt, I felt human emotions, but my action 
was not to panic. My action was not to run to Google and search all the possible outcomes. My action was to go inside and pick up my Bible with my husband and start praying. Michael Todd says, God promises peace, but he doesn't promise the absence of pressure. I'm not saying my situation was the perfect reaction to chaos or I had perfect faith because there are times that no, I, you know, I did doubt. I struggled to get that mustard seed sized faith sometimes. John 16, 33 says, Jesus has already overcome the world. He has already overcome. So the only way we can overcome what we are facing is if you are in the one who has overcome it all. There is a video of Priscilla Shire and she's sharing about her mom's passing and she is talking about John 15, 5, the, the vine dresser, the vine and the branches. And she says, if you read that scripture, that whole scripture, the vine dresser is working. The vine dresser is God. The vine is working, the vine is Jesus. But the only one in that vineyard who is not working are the branches. And the branches, all they're doing is just abiding. They're just being with Jesus, staying connected. And that is all that Jesus asks us to do. Because if we are there, if we are connected, if we are abiding in him, if we are pursuing him more than we're pursuing anything else in the world, it doesn't matter what life circumstance we're faced with. We'll feel the human emotions. We'll feel the chaos and, and the rage around us, but our actions will be different. Thank you guys so much for watching this. Comment below and let me know if this was helpful for you, if it was encouraging to you at all, and even comment below and maybe share some of the answers to the questions that I asked. But thank you guys so much for watching and I will talk to you in the next one. Remember to love God, love yourself, and love people. Bye guys.